Right, well, good afternoon. So uh, I'm the first speaker today, and my role is to introduce some of the concepts that we're going to uh, be touching on later. And because it's December, I thought I'd do this with a bit of a tongue-in-cheek uh, festive feel. And so basically the question is, when will Santa get to my house? And this is very much uh, a tale of forecast uncertainty. So we're going to be helped along the way today by uh, this, uh, this elf here. And we're going to be talking through a number of key concepts that are going to really help put everything else in this afternoon into context. So I'm going to tr try to cover an awful lot here. I mean, each of these is a lecture course in itself, but we're going to be talking about initial condition uncertainty, model uncertainty, the quickest ever explanation of data simulation. <laughs> then we're going to talk about spaghetti plots, contour plots, ensemble metergrams, stochastic physics, and even some current areas of research. And uh, does anyone, can anyone guess the name of this elf? No, it's Elf Richardson. Right. Right, so here is our problem. We have some young children who are absolutely desperate to see Father Christmas when he comes to their house, but they have a dilemma. They don't know what time he's going to come down the chimney and they don't know what time Father Christmas is going to come to their living room. So what should they do? Either they stay awake, but then they risk falling asleep and being asleep just as he arrives and then they miss him altogether. Or they could go to bed early and set an alarm so that they wake up as Father Christmas comes, but then the question is at what time should they set that alarm for? So throughout the talk, uh, this talk, I'm going to try to keep drawing the parallels between the Father Christmas stuff and the, the weather forecasting stuff. So basically, this is the same as there's a chance of a serious weather event. What should you do? So option one is you do nothing and you go, you know what? I'm not going to spend any money uh, protecting myself and I'll just let things happen. And if they happen, I will take mitigating action once I know what needs to happen. And if that's more expensive, well, so be it. Or you could decide to invest early. So you take preventative action to avoid any potential impact. But then obviously you then risk uh, the possibility that you've spent money unnecessarily, as it were, that you've pr protected yourself from something that hasn't happened. So here's our map of the world for the purposes of today. And so these children live in uh, southern England. And we all know that Father Christmas heads off and he heads east. He goes to New Zealand and then he works from east to west. We'll take that for granted. In the same way that we know about the maths and the physics of how the atmosphere works, you know, we can write those equations down and we, we understand the problem. So we need to start this problem off. We need some initial condition. So where is Father Christmas starting from? North Pole. North Pole. Brilliant, North Pole. But is that grid north? Or is that like <laughs> magnetic north? Or actually, I think there's some Finns and Norwegians in the back, and they will be adamant that he actually comes from Lapland. So, so even in our initial conditions, we're not actually completely sure what the situation is. And so this is the same with the state of the atmosphere. We don't really know what the current state of the atmosphere is, perfectly all the variables at every at every location we don't know that perfectly and even if we did there are some atmospheric states which are inherently more or less predictable in terms of predicting the weather pattern over western europe five days later so the next question is well what time does he leave so he's going to leave on the evening of christmas eve fine but if he's leaving from uh, northern Canada, it turns out there's some fog. And so actually he might be delayed. He might leave just before the fog hits or might be delayed by a couple of hours. Similarly, if he's leaving from Lapland, there happens to be a really strong jet stream and then he'll go eastwards really quickly. And so. Given those different initial states, where he's going to be a few hours later could be quite different. And so the parallel here is. El Nino uh, Southern Oscillation and so or the North Atlantic Oscillation. So there are atmospheric states which in terms of how predictable it is over Western Europe a week later, there are situations where we are better at predicting the weather a week later 
and other cases where we're not. Right, so a few hours go by and depending on where he left and depending on exactly when he left, we know that a few hours later, Father Christmas is somewhere in New Zealand. And so we can kind of draw contours here. These are kind of contours of equal probability. And so there's a range of possible places where Father Christmas is. And for the purposes of drawing parallels to weather forecasting, we're going to call this our, our background, our kind of our, our first guess uh, prediction of where Father Christmas is. Now, at the same time, all the kids are on social media and they've got their phones and they're there on whatever social media platform still exists today. And they're there sort of saying, oh, I've seen Father Christmas and I'm in Wellington and someone else is like, oh, I'm in Canterbury. Someone else is in some island off Papua New Guinea and like, yep, yeah, I've seen Father Christmas. And so you've got these observations and each of them come there geotagged, so you know where and when that observation happened. But, you know, you've got to take these with a pinch of salt. So. Basically, we've got a background forecast of where we think Father Christmas is by now with some error bar because we know that prediction is not perfect. And then we've got all these kids saying that they've seen Father Christmas. But again, there's a pretty big error bar there because, you know, they're high on sugar and they're really, really excited. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. And so we want it, what we want to do is we want to kind of blend that together. We want to kind of get our optimal blend of what is the most likely place where Father Christmas is. And so we're going to combine these two together and we're going to create what we call an analysis. So this is our optimal blend of the background forecast with its errors, combined with observations and a knowledge of their errors to kind of give us our best guess of where we think Father Christmas is. And so here we have a modified set of contours, which looks a little bit like the initial prediction uh, over here, and it looks a little bit like the observations over there. Right. So we have our starting state that we're going to go from. So thankfully, we know the speed of reindeers and we know that speed is distance over time and hence the distance traveled is speed times time. So if we know where he starts and sometime later, we can have a pretty good guess of where he's going to be assuming some trajectory. Right. So the speed of travel obviously is V reindeer. Right. However, how long, how far does Father Christmas go? Well, that's based on, on the time, and so it's the elapsed time, but there is a correction to take into account here. And this is where I'm doing the, the parallel with stochastic physics. So we've got the time is the elapsed time minus the mince pie effect. So basically, what we've got to add here is the number of houses that he visits multiplied by the probability of him having a mince pie in each house multiplied by the time it takes to eat that mince pie. And that total amount of time is a reduction in the elapsed time that he can use to travel. There's also obviously the mold wine effect that needs to come in with a higher probability, obviously. And as we all know, Father Christmas does have the tendency to get stuck up the chimney. So you take all these factors together. And so the amount of time that he's actually traveling for six hours later, well, he might not have actually traveled for six hours, probably somewhere between five and a half and five and a quarter, but we don't know. And so if you were to code this up, you would have a probability there. So you'd have a random number generator and say, and you say, well, if I pick this random number, I do this. And if not, you do that. And that's the same kind of thing that we do in weather forecasting, where we have stochastic physics, where you have some random number uh, that perturbs your forecast. And so this is the, the analogy here. So we know the physics of the atmosphere. So very briefly, we know the primitive equation. So this is fluid dynamics on a rotating sphere. Easy peasy. And then there's the subgrid processes, which are typically parameterized. So this is uh, radiative transfer, cloud cover, convection, rain, snow, flow of orography. All that stuff gets uh, written down as equations and we combine them so that our total tendency and by tendency here, I mean the rate of change of temperature with time. So the total tendency T is the dynamics bit, which is the, the large scale fluid evolution, plus all the physics. And there is this little epsilon term here. So this is the random noise. So this is a, a random number with a mean of zero uh, that slightly increases or decreases any one of those bits of physics. And that's what we do in forecasting. Right. 
So let's launch our first forecast. So we we start off from one of the possible places that Santa can start from, and we don't overthink it, but you know, we have some trajectory that he's going to follow, and sometimes later that is where he's going to be. But let's not just do this once, because that would be a bit daft, wouldn't it? Because that's sort of saying that we think that one forecast is going to be perfect. So let's run this several times, like three or four or maybe like eight times. And so what we're doing here is we're doing an ensemble. We're saying, well, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but here's a range of possible outcomes, each of which are equally probable. So that's the, the end of each of those little trajectories is where he might be sometime later. And then further on into the future, this is effectively spaghetti plots. This is all the possible trajectories of where Father Christmas might be six hours later or so. So uh, this is completely analogous to having the track of a hurricane going through the Gulf of Mexico and seeing it veer or not um, as it makes landfall. So how do we how do we interpret all of this? I mean, there's there's all these uh, lines that they're, they're quite hard to interpret. So one thing we can do is we can take the ensemble mean. And so what I've done here is I've drawn a line, which is the mean trajectory. A couple of things to note from that is what well, that mean is. It's exactly that it's a mean. So the place where the mean shows Santa is none of the ensemble members had him there at that time. There's the same with like the location of a low pressure center compared to the location of the low pressure center in the ensemble mean. Similarly, the trajectory itself, because it's an average, it's very smooth, even though each of the individual trajectories is a lot noisier. So, as I said, similar to the path of a hurricane or the path of a windstorm coming over Western Europe, there's lots of possible paths and the ensemble mean gives you an average. Are there better ways of uh, depicting this in a more informative way. So one thing we could do is to plot a probability map of where is Santa at 1 a.m. And so what I've sketched out here are contours of equal probability, looking at all the possible places where those trajectories end. And maybe rather than doing eight, you might do 20 or 50 or 100 of these ensemble members. And so you could then draw your contour plot of all the possible places he can be. Right. So this is the same as now the cone of uncertainty. Rather than showing the track of the hurricanes coming through the Gulf of Mexico, we sometimes see these cone of uncertainties where you have a cone with shading that kind of goes yellow and red as you get nearer the center. That shows the probability of, this, of the hurricane center going within a certain distance of, of that point. OK, those are good ways of showing the forecast and depicting it. Are there other things we could do? So. Santa, Santa is coming across the world, he's going from east to west. What, and we've got eight ensemble members giving us a prediction of where he's going to be. So what we could do is we could look at the median time by which Santa has been. So what that means is you've got eight ensemble members. So what is the time by which four of them show Santa has been and four of the ensemble members shows that he hasn't been? And so you can then plot isochrones, so lines of equal time, and you would have a map like this. So he's starting off uh, in the in the southeast in New Zealand at uh, 2100 Greenwich Mean Time. And then as you progress further in time, these are the lines of where he's where in a median sense he has got to on his journey. And so what we see from that is at half past midnight, 0030, there's a 50-50 chance that he has already been through London. OK. Does that help us make a decision? Does it help the kids make the decision as to what to do? So. Uh, I've just said that. So the analogy here is some freezing rain. So we've got a, a we've got a cold front coming through with some really cold air underneath, and we know there's going to be some hit some freezing rain and we know it's going to hit the M25. What we don't know is whether it's going to be on Friday during rush hour or three hours after rush hour. And so in a very simple sense, what we could say, it's exactly the same weather. It's exactly the same location, but the human impact is very, very different. And this is something we're going to come back to in some later talks. 
is that it's not just about forecasting the weather, where and when, it's, well, does it matter? And then does it matter for decision making? So the maps themselves, they're, they're helpful, but they're not always that useful for making decisions if you're at one location. So from the point of view of these children, they want to know, should I stay up or should I go to bed? Similarly, should a council grit their roads? Is it going to be freezing? Do I grit the roads and spend money on salt and wages for the lorry drivers to grit the roads to prevent the accidents? Or do I not bother and then deal with the road traffic accidents the next day? So let's do some probabilities here. So here is a time height plot. So we've got time along the bottom from 1800 yesterday evening over Christmas Eve to midnight into the early hours of Christmas Day. And then along the Y axis, we've got the probability that Santa visits within this hour. And so what we see from here, obviously, is that between 0 and 1 a.m. is the most likely window when Father Christmas is going to come. But there are non-zero probabilities either side of that. So what do you do? So we can integrate that, basically sum that up going from left to right, and we get a cumulative probability distribution. So this is the probability that Santa will have visited by the end of this hour. And so what we're seeing here is that by, by uh, nine o'clock in the evening on Christmas Eve, you know, there's 5% chance that Santa's been. And then as you go through the peak of this distribution, this accelerates and climbs quite quickly, and then the probabilities uh, get much higher, and then they kind of plateau off later on. So we can draw a smooth line through that, and then we can say, right, these children are very wise, and they know about their own risk appetite, and they know, they know that they want a 50-50% chance of seeing Father Christmas. And they're aware that, you know, for the sake of argument, they're going to believe in Father Christmas for 10 years and they're going to stay up 10 years and they want to, on average, see him five times. But if they don't see him on one particular time, it's OK, as long as the stats work out in the long run. <laughs> so they want a 50 50 chance of seeing him on that night. So what should they do? So you look at the 25th and 75th probabilities along there. You read down the graph. And so that tells you that between 22.45 and 00.40, if you stay up during that time window, there is a 50% chance that you will see Father Christmas. And that is a tailored forecast based on the risk appetite that they have told you. So the end user is telling you what they want and what their cost loss is, and then the forecast is tailored to their needs and presented in a way that's informative for them. So an analogy here would be cancelling some flights. So for example, we're forecasting fog over Heathrow at some point tomorrow morning. There are flights that are going to come in. Are they going to be able to land? Therefore, where are those flights coming from? Therefore, where are the airports you need to cancel the flights leaving so that they're not in the air and able to land? Right. Now let's have a little look at some stochastic physics in weather forecasting. So I'm simplifying things somewhat here, but in the, the first example, uh, number one, I have a profile. So this is temperature and humidity up through height uh, at what location of the atmosphere. And this is one location in one model grid box. And then my blue box is some traditional physics scheme. So this could be a convection scheme or a precipitation scheme that calculates some rate of change of temperature and humidity as a result of this process. And so what we see on the other side, so these are the inputs, temperature and humidity now, and this is the, the, the warming and cooling, and this is the drying and moistening as a result of this process. So that's a standalone deterministic bit of physics. So the way that we can illustrate two common methods of stochastic physics are with these two panels here. So the first one, which is effectively stochastically perturbed physics tendencies, SPPT, is to perturb the increments as they come out. So you run your scheme and then you have a random number generator, for example, that gives you some numbers between 0.8 and 1.2, and you multiply your increments by that number. A couple of key things here, because you're multiplying what comes out, 
All you can do is stretch it and compress it. You can't change the shape in the vertical. You can't change. Um, yeah, you can't change the shape of the profile. You can just make it bigger or smaller. Another approach that's used uh, in weather forecasting is to perturb the parameters within the scheme. So in here, there's lots of lines of code and there'll be things like the critical relative humidity for cloud formation or uh, convective entrainment rates or the threshold at which cloud becomes rain. So each of those are parameters that you kind of know, but you know, you could kind of tweak them a bit. And so you could randomly sample from a range of possible values of those parameters. And if you were to do that, then that would give you a range of possible outcomes, range of, you know, different um, warming and cooling profiles. And the key thing here is that you could be changing the shape as well as just inflating it or compressing it. You can, and you could be changing the shape to the point where, for example, convection doesn't trigger at all, in which case you just get a straight line. So going forward, I mean, there's been uh, an awful lot of interest uh, across all areas of science in, uh, in the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning and neural networks. And so one thing that we, we can do is to emulate a scheme. So you, you try to represent a scheme in a simplified way using a deep neural network. And so this is illustrated here. You've got your input, prof input profiles, you've got your multiple layer neural network, and then you've got some, some output coming at the end. And what you can do is that you can, when you actually run this in your forecast model, you could randomly ignore some nodes. So you just randomly ignore bits of it in order to generate a range of uh, different profiles. Something else that we could do is to vary the inputs to a scheme. So what we could do is you could take loads of observations from radio sons or some satellites or from high resolution model data. You could take loads of information about profiles and then average them in space and say, well, actually, when we know that the temperature and humidity looks like this on a 20 kilometer scale, there's lots of other plausible profiles that it could actually be slightly warmer, slightly cooler in certain places. Um, and so we, we could uh, create a machine learning algorithm that given the current state says, well, actually, it could be slightly different. This is what this would be. And then that you then pass into either your traditional scheme as before or into your uh, stochastic emulator. And that would give you a range of um, temperature uh, and humidity increments to put into your model. And so this is something that we're doing at the Met Office. We've got a project called Caramel, which stands for Cloud Resolving Model Machine Learning. And so what we're doing is that we're running the unified model at one and a half kilometer resolutions. We're running 80 of these nests dotted around the world. And in each of these nests, we then coarse grain. So we average the one and a half kilometer data to, for example, 45 kilometers, and then um, try to predict, to try to get back what all that high resolution information was that we've averaged out. So that in the future, given your mean state, you could uh, generate some alternative um, profiles from that. And one of the ways that we're doing this is we're, we're planning for this to be scale aware. So we're not just going to average over 45 kilometers. We're going to do it over 10, 20, 50, 100, 150 kilometers. So that the whole um, scheme could potentially be used in climate simulations with a 150 kilometer grid box, but it could also be used in a, in a global forecasting system at 20 or 15 or even 10 kilometers. So, oh, been a whistle stop tour with uh, our elf here, and we've covered quite a lot of stuff, which hopefully gets you right in the mindset for the other talks. So we've talked about initial condition uncertainty, model uncertainty, data simulation and spaghetti plots, contour plots, metergrams, stochastic physics, and some current research. And I'm going to stop there and take a few questions. Thank you very much, Cyril. That was really interesting uh, and light-hearted talk. Um, there must be some questions, I guess, um, from the audience.
Yeah. Spence. <laughs> <laughs> nice and warm in here. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, in your list of um, options for uh, the, the physics, for the uncertainties in physics, uh, you didn't include uh, st actual stochastic parameterization, where you uh, solve the equation, uh, the, the stochastic equation for the process. There was, you know, a few years ago, a lot of people were working on that. Has it gone out of fashion, or uh, are we assuming that AI is, is the solution instead now, or, or was it just a, an omission? So it was partially an omission. It's partially a what can we do relatively easily without. So what can we do to modify the schemes that we already have? And either emulate those schemes or perturb those schemes without ripping out the whole of the physics and starting again. I mean, what, what you're proposing is is perfectly sensible, but it would be a much. Much bigger piece of work to do which we could do in the in parallel and have deliver later. Okay, thank you for the nice entertaining talk. Uh, again, for the stochastic physics uh, parameterizations, in the last example, the coarse graining, uh, would you use the same parameterization scheme for the low resolution? The high, or the high resolution or this parametrization is a scale aware. I mean, it will be different. <laughs> okay, so the, the, there's... So the parametrization is not the same, perhaps. Are, are you asking whether the parameterizations used in the kilometer scale model are the same as the ones in the global model? In part, yes. Although the kilometer scale model does not have a cumulus parameterization scheme, that's completely switched off. And some of the cloud macrophysics schemes are tuned differently, and the, lots of other things are tuned differently. So it's it's not exactly the same physics, but it's a sensibly tuned different physics, which is used for operational forecasting over the UK and other places. So we're fairly confident that it's all right. Once you coarse grain that, the idea would be to then be able to use the same thing in different resolution global configurations 